Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Lentz, and I'm the Director of Marketing of Analytics Marketing at Unchained Labs. I'll be your moderator today, and thank you for joining us. We will have a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So to ask questions, all you have to do is click on the Q&A uh, button in the Zoom navigation bar at the top or bottom of your screen and type in your question. When submitting your question, please avoid clicking the anonymous button so we can reach out via email if we aren't able to get to your question live. Uh, but we will get to as many of them as we can. Uh, now, I'd like to introduce Andre Miller, Product Manager for Uncle at Unchained Labs. Today, Andre will walk us through how to use Uncle to address AAV stability problems, showing data to compare a few formulation conditions and their effect on AAV capsid stability, including during freeze-thaw cycles. And now I'll hand it over to Andre. Andre, how's it going this morning? Hey, Kevin, it's going really well. It's uh, 1 a.m. and it's everything is fabulous. So let me start my sharing here. And I didn't say hello to Europe. Oh. Yeah, right, yeah. Hello, Europe. Hello, Radio Free Europe. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me this morning for my presentation on how to wring all the stability information out of your AAV using our uncle. To start things off, I want to talk about if the slides advance. I want to talk about um, the Ever Forward. It is a container ship that was trying to leave Baltimore Harbor here in the eastern US and got stuck mud, much like its sister ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal. Um, in this case here, they had to take some containers off. They had to wait for a high tide to refloat the ship, and eventually they got it to move again. Um, but it took a lot of work. You might be wondering, why am I telling you a story about a container ship? Well, the container ship is kind of a simile to what we have in the, in, the, in, the, in the AAV, in the viral vector, because the viral vector is also a ferry. It brings genomic material to the nucleus of the cells where it's supposed to have its effect. And much like a container ship or much like a ferry, it needs to get to the destination. It needs to get to the destination with cargo uh, to be able to have the desired effect. Now, of course, in order to take care of your AVs cargo, you spend a lot of time finding the best possible capsid, the best possible transgene, but then what? You have to also find a good formulation. Enhances uh, or keeps uh, your AAV nice and stable. And then we all like freezing things down because when something is frozen, it's normally preserved and can be used, can be stored for a very long time. Is there any way that the formulation can su support the stability of an AAV during freeze thaws? These are questions I think that are very relevant uh, when it comes to, to AAV development and developability. And an example for that, a contextualization with, uh, with this is um, the example of Zolgensma. It's an AAV drug that has been approved by the, by the FDA and it is used. Uh, but once you, re once you re receive it, you have to use it within two weeks. You can refrigerate it for two weeks, but you cannot freeze it again. So that limits the, the this, this shelf life limitation limits or makes it very complicated for you to have to plan whenever you want to use it um, because you can't just freeze it. Luxterna, another AAV drug, can be frozen at minus 65 degrees Celsius and that way you can keep it in the freezer and everything is, you don't have to plan things out as diligently as you would with Zolgensma. So these two real life examples of AAV drugs that have been approved show how important it is to spend time working on formulation of AAVs and to see how that formulation can support um, the actual stability of your drug. Now, what can we bring to the table to help you work on this? Well, enter Uncle, our all-in-one stability platform. We can use it to assess the stability of viral vectors, but we can also use it to assess the stability of other proteins, and we can use dyes, and we can um, use the protein intrinsic fluorescence. So Uncle is very flexible in that. And then, of course, stability is nothing without formulation. We can also characterize the effect that different formulations may have on the, um, on the stability of either proteins or viral vectors. How does Uncle do this? Uncle does this by combining three distinct detection methods in one instrument. The three modes are fluorescence, static light scattering, and dynamic light scattering. In fluorescence in Uncle, we use two laser systems, a laser at 266 nanometers and a laser at 473 nanometers, so a UV laser and a blue laser, and we use those to excite fluorescence of the analytes. We would then read the emission of fluorescence uh, in a full spectrum from 250 to 720 nanometers, and this flexibility 
keeps you in control. If you want to focus on the protein intrinsic fluorescence, you would most likely use the 266 nanometer laser. If you want to use a dye like Cipro Orange or Cyber Gold, examples of this will be coming up in the rest of this talk, then we would use the blue laser most likely at 473 and look at a further um, a red shifted uh, emission uh, peak. Static light scattering, the second measurement modality is a readout of molar mass. And we use that to monitor aggregation. Uh, we can use both the static light scattering signal at 266 and the one at 473, giving us a nice and wide dynamic range of monitoring aggregation of an analyte. Dynamic length is also a measurement of aggregation. However, it doesn't look at the molar mass and the molar mass increase. It looks at the hydrodynamic size of the particle. That's a pretty quick measurement only about 30 seconds, I would say. So this could also be used as a good quality control step before starting a long-term experiment to make sure your sample is still in the shape that you want it and the size that you want it. So the diameter for an AV would be around 30 nanometers. And if you see that you have something much larger right at the beginning, it might be a good idea to reprep or find out why aggregation has occurred already then. Uncle also, and I didn't have this on the slide, but I'm gonna tell you, has temperature control. So you can set the temperature between 15 degrees Celsius and 95 degrees Celsius. You can ramp or you can keep it steady. So uh, Uncle is ready for isothermal experiments and for ramping experiments. These three detection modes combine to a dozen different applications. Um, I'm showing them all here for completeness, but we will today focus on the TMT ag applications on melting temperature of proteins and aggregation temperature of proteins. Then, because we're working with viral vectors, we're going to look at the viral capsicibility app. Um, and we also have a, a little bit of information about the sizing and polydispersity information. The others, as I said, I'm showing them here for completeness. But if you want to learn more, let us know. I'm happy to talk about, for example, colloidal stability parameters like KD, B22, and G22, or about um, the uh, isothermal chemical denaturation experiments in delta G. So UNCLE keeps you very flexible. And when it comes to looking at uh, viral vectors, there are two phenomena that we can characterize in UNCLE, capsid stability and aggregation. Let's start with this one, aggregation. We would have a viral vector capsid, and that can aggregate, or it can fall apart and then aggregate. This aggregation, we can definitely, or both types of aggregation, will be monitorable or can be monitored in our static or dynamic light scattering. When it comes to capsid stability, a capsid is composed of proteins, um, and these will melt. These will <clears throat> lose their native fold, and then the capsid will fall apart. So that's one of the steps um, that is required to characterize the capsid stability. The thing that makes AAV different from other proteins is the fact that it has it carries a transgene that it can eject. So in, in terms of capsid stability, we have this second pathway of capsid stability that we need to characterize, and that is the genome ejection pathway. We look at all of these phenomena today. Um, and let's first take a look at the capsid disruption. So the, the first part of uh, capsid stability. In order to look at the stability of the capsid proteins and the melting behavior of the capsid proteins, we make use of the protein's intrinsic fluorescence. The capsid proteins contain amino acids, aromatic, that will be uh, absorbing the UV excitation wavelengths and also emit, in the, uh, emit fluorescent light. When the residues like tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine are buried on the inside of the protein in a lipophilic hydrophobic environment, or after melting when they're on the outside in the hydrophilic environment, their fluorescence will change. This plot here is the raw data you get out of an uncle experiment, shows the different spectra. And you can see one spectral line here for every um, degree, actually, every, I think for every half degree in this temperature gradient, so it's too many to be 80, so I think it's more like 160. Uh, we see as the temperature increases, the fluorescence <clears throat> peak height decreases, and also the maximum shifts slightly to longer wavelengths, so-called redshift. Um, this is the signal, or the change of the signal is what we're monitoring to get to the melting temperature. I'll show you how this data looks after processing in the next slide. But before going there, I also want to point out this spike here. This is the 266 nanometer spike, uh, and we would uh, integrate the area under the peak. Um, and that would be our static light scattering signal that we use to monitor aggregation. Now, but let's take a look at this intrinsic fluorescence and what it looks like when we plot it in an XY plot. 
this being the raw data, and then um, the actual readout will take from this one. So we have the intrinsic fluorescence on the left in blue, and we have static light scattering on the right in green. This, the way we plot our fluorescence is BCM, the baric centric mean, which is the spectral center of gravity of your fluorescence emission peak. It is the one wavelength that divides the area under the peak in two equal halves. Because UNCLE measures full spectrum fluorescence, we can take the, say, 120 wavelengths that are spanning the width of the fluorescence emission peak and integrate that entire information in our BCM analysis, which make, gives it a good signal to noise ratio and is integrating over more data points than just comparing two different wavelengths in a ratio, for example. When we monitor this BCM, um, Wavelengths in uh, the temperature gradient, we can see it increasing, and then there's an inflection point, and that would be the melting temperature of the viral vector capsid proteins. When we're looking at the static light scattering, we're looking at the aggregation. This is kind of flat, kind of boring in the beginning, and at about 75 degrees, it starts increasing. And then at about 85 degrees, there's an immense, immense tremendous increase of the aggregation of static light scattering signal, uh, indicating the aggregation of the capsid proteins. In AAVs, usually the uh, aggregation happens in concert with the melting of the capsid proteins, and this is confirmed here. Um, so much introduction, so much theory behind it. Now let's take a look at the experiment we will focus on today. We used a commercially available AAV preparation purchased from a company here in the Bay Area with a cytomegalovirus promoter controlling DFP, so a very typical standard um, transgene in, this, in, this, in these uh, AAVs. And then we had them in three different buffer conditions. Our buffer one is a pH 7.4 phosphate buffer with some poloxamer in it. In order to make buffer two, we added 200 millimolar sodium chloride to buffer one. And in order to make buffer three, we added 5% weight by volume of tracolose to it. So I'll be referring to these three buffers as buffer one phosphate, buffer two sodium chloride, and buffer three tracolose in the rest of the talk. We then took those commercial AV preps that we had in the buffers and went to uh, put them through free stars, one free star or three free star cycles. Start slide I want to show you is the fact that we can differentiate the AAV serotypes by looking at the melting behavior of the actual capsid protein. We see here AAV2 in gray, AAV5 in green, and AAV9 in blue, and they are all in the sodium chloride buffer, buffer two, and we see that AAV5 is the most temperature stable one. Um, the melting temperature here in this case is at around 88 degrees Celsius. A2 is the least stable one. Uh, melting of the uh, capsid proteins occurs already at 69.4 degrees. And then the intermediate one is AAV9. Um, so we can use the intrinsic fluorescence and the melting temperature by intrinsic fluorescence to differentiate those serotypes. When we go through three free star cycles with them, the melting temperature shift. The arrows I put in here are proportional to the shift of the melting temperature. You can see that for AV9 is about 2.2 degrees uh, reduction of the melting temperature, uh, a little bit less uh, for AV5, and then AV2 doesn't change too much. However, we see that the melting or the free star cycle leads to a destabilization of the capsid protein as reported by the melting temperature. Now, let's shift gears a little bit and at one serotype in different buffer conditions. And we start with AV5, and we look at the melting in uh, phosphate buffer, in sodium chloride buffer, and trehalose buffer. And you can see that they are all pretty much, they're pretty similar to each other. So they vary only by about one degree Celsius. However, when we take the static light scattering information from, from UNCLE into account to monitor aggregation, this is a much more varied picture that emerges. Phosphate shows very little aggregation. Trehalose shows a little bit more, but we have a lot of aggregation occurring in sodium chloride. So AAV5 doesn't seem to care so much about the buffer condition for the protein, um, the capsid protein melting. However, for the aggregation, there is uh, a dependence on um, or an effect of the formulation. When we look at the effects that freeze stars may have, 
So we have the no free stock condition on the left here and the three free stock condition on the right with the melting temperatures in the solid bars and then the aggregation temperatures in the hatched bars. We can see that both the melting temperatures and the aggregation temperatures shift to slightly lower values as a function of the three free stock cycles. Um, for um, the sodium chloride condition here, it's a shift by about one and a half degrees Celsius. For aggregation here, it's, it's it remains it's 0 0.6, so it's not that much. So there's a slight destabilization of A85 during the free stock cycles, but it's not, um, not very much. When we look at another serotype, AAV9, we can see a much bigger effect of the buffer of the formulation condition on the stability of the AAV serotype. Here, um, think back of AAV5, we saw a difference of about one degree in the capsid melting temperatures. Here, the different uh, melting temperatures span an area of more than four degrees Celsius. So AAV9 is much more impacted by the formulation or the stability of AAV9 as read by the melting of the capsid proteins is much more impacted by the buffer condition. Um, here is a, a DLS readout, I promised that earlier, uh, for AAV9. And we can see that, well, we start with an AAV prep at around 29 nanometers, which is typical for an AAV in the diameter. Um, after heating it up to 95 degrees, we have a, a diameter of 250, so it's almost 10 times as much as it was in the beginning. Plus, you can see the peak is much wider, so the polydispersity has increased, which is a typical effect uh, that a temperature gradient has on a protein. It aggregates, and the DLS here is an orthogonal readout to what I showed you earlier for SLS. When we look at the effect that free star cycles have on AAV, we have the no free star condition on the left and the three free star condition here on the right, and the temperature of scale I have chosen on the left side is the same scale that we had before for AV5. And we saw at the very beginning of the talk already that AV9 is more, it has lower melting temperatures compared with AV5. So this is mirrored here as well. So comparing the three conditions uh, and the melting temperatures in the three uh, buffer conditions in no free stall and three free stalls here, um, sodium in, in the phosphate condition in green, we have a shift of the melting temperature in three free star cycles. The temperature shifts by almost five degrees. If we look at the effect of sodium chloride, um, there is also a shift of the melting temperature to lower temperatures, but it's not as severe. There's a shift here about two degrees. So it seems like sodium chloride addition to our buffer is able to stabilize the AV9 capsid somewhat. If we're looking at the effect of trehalose, there is no change. It's exactly the same melting temperature for these two conditions, uh, for no free, comparing no free stall and three free stalls. So trehalose, which we chose as a cryoprotectant, does its thing and protects the AV in, this, in these three free stall cycles. So summarizing what we saw for the capsid um, protein melting behavior, AV5 is not so dependent on the buffer. It doesn't show much difference with different buffers. AV9 shows a bigger difference. And also when it comes to free star cycles, the, shake, the changes in the melting temperature in AV9 are larger than the changes that we have observed in AV5. Now let's uh, switch over to the other mode of characterizing the stability of an AV capsid, and that is the um, genome ejection assay. In this case, we're adding a dye, cyber gold, to our preparation. This is an intercalating dye that will interact with the nucleic acid. In this case of an AAV, it would be single-stranded DNA, and it will change its fluorescence the more DNA is present. So by monitoring the fluorescence of cyber gold in the temperature gradient, we can assess how much DNA is being released. Proof of concept being shown here, the raw data again, we have fluorescence from cyber gold. And as the temperature increases, so does the fluorescence because more and more um, DNA is present um, as a function of genome ejection from the capsid in the temperature gradient. This is the raw data. Let's take a look at what it looks like when it's changed into an XY plot. Um, again, fluorescence is on the left y-axis in blue, and the um, static light scattering for aggregation is on the right y-axis here in green. Um, these are commercially available 
um, AAV preps. We did not treat them with DNAs. So there is some DNA initially present already. That's, that's why our fluorescence is not starting at zero, but has, there is some fluorescence already in the beginning. This fluorescence decreases with temperature. This is a usual effect of cyber cold. And then the fluorescence starts increasing again once the capsids start releasing their genomic payload. Um, it peaks. Um, and then we can take a look at uh, where the inflection point is, and that would be our melting temperature of genome ejection or genome ejection temperature. We do, of course, in uncle simultaneously measure static light scattering. Uh, this is the one using the blue laser because the blue laser is what we're using to excite the um, cyber gold dye here. And again, it's a pretty flat line. And then at around 75 degrees, this aggregation starts increasing. And as we saw earlier in capsids and viral capsids, usually the aggregation is connected or it's happening in concert with the melting of the capsid proteins. So we can say that that must be happening somewhere where the TAG here is. And that's about 17 degrees different from the genome injection. So about 17 degrees before the capsid proteins start unfolding, does the capsid already lose its or eject its, its uh, payload. Um, when we look at AAV5 in different conditions. So we have, again, uh, AAV5 in phosphate in green, in sodium chloride in blue, and in trehalose in uh, gray. And we have the no free star condition, one free star condition, and three free star conditions. There's not that much change of the uh, genome ejection of AAV5 with varying buffer. Um, you see that there's the only case where maybe there's a significant change would be for the trehalose between one and three free stars. But all in all, this is pretty unperturbed. Um, again, here, AAV5, uh, when it comes to the genome injection um, in a free star R3. A very different picture emerges when we look at AAV9. Um, so in this case, uh, again, it's the same scale as for AAV. So we can see the temperatures are all a little bit lower here in this case, and we see a higher variability. Um, comparing, or let's take a look at the phosphate first in green, and you can see that in one free star cycle, it seems to be going up, but also the error bar is wider here. So this is a more varied measurement. Really, if you are working with an AV and you know you will only have to go to max one free star cycle, then maybe the phosphate condition is okay. But you can see a significant decrease in the genome ejection temperature with three freeze star cycles. So if you need to freeze it more than once, uh, phosphate is not the buffer system of choice. If you have sodium chloride, however, that actually has a stabilizing effect, has increases the genome ejection uh, temperature here uh, in one or three freeze stars. And trehalose, as we saw before, keeps things nice and steady and the genome ejection temperature does not vary. So, uh, comparing AV5 and AV9, comparing the genome ejection data with what we know from before for the capsid stability data or the, the viral capsid unfolding data, it looks like AV9 is more susceptible to buffer conditions and more susceptible to free source cycles, whereas AV5 is more unperturbed about things. All in all, summarizing this, capsids react differently. Formulations can impact capsid disruption, genome ejection, and aggregation. And studying every capsid in a variety of formulation is important to understand what can increase this stability. Formulations can also help with free stock cycles. We saw sodium chloride has a stabilizing effect, and trehalose also does. Maybe it would be a good idea to also try them in combined fashion. UNCLE is the tool you can use to look at all these capsid stability issues. You can uh, look at um, genome ejection, you can look at capsid stability, you look at aggregation, and you can do this in thermal ramps, and you can do, also do this isothermally over several hours, days, or a week. All in all, UNCLE will help you focus on the vector with the transgene that you've worked so hard in making, and make sure that you're not working with something that has fallen apart, or working with a ferry that has lost its cargo, and you're just looking at an empty boat. All in all, you want to have an ever forward sailing cargo ship that brings your DNA to the place in the cell, in the nucleus, where it will unfold its effect that you have um, prepared. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm going to be happy to take your questions.
All right. Uh, thank you, Andre, for taking us through how to use uncle to detect when AAV caps of proteins become unstable and how full spectrum fluorescence gives you an essential tool uh, to monitor both the proteins themselves and the you know, genome injection by that payload with the, with the cargo ship analogy, um, especially including the, the effect of stability that different formulations have uh, and how different serotypes and formulations react to freeze thaw cycles. Uh, so we have some great questions that have already been submitted. Uh, but if you're out there in the audience and you want to still ask a question, you can do so by entering it in the Q&A uh, section of your Zoom navigation bar. So let's get to the questions. So why is full spectrum fluorescence necessary to characterize AAV stability? Um, full spectrum fluorescence is necessary to characterize AAV stability because there are two distinct pathways that need to be characterized. It's the stability of the viral vector capsid protein and the unfolding of the same, where we want to look more at the blue region of the spectrum. And we have a reporter diet we can use to look at the ejection of the genome, which would be focusing more on the red area of, of the uh, emission spectrum. So by measuring the full spectrum, we can make sure we capture all the different aspects of uh, capsid stability and not just looking at one, because you want to know that you have a capsid that's there and has something in it still. Uh, can we use UNCLE to study our AAV in isothermal experiments? Are there any evaporations or chemical compatibility concerns? Yeah, uh, totally can. Um, um, as I was uh, mentioning in the, in the summary slide, um, UNCLE, so the samples that are introduced into UNCLE, and I didn't talk about the consumable at all, so maybe this is also a good book to talk about that. Uh, we use nine microliters of sample in a quartz cuvette, and we have an array of 16 quartz cuvettes, that's called the uni. And in the uni, uh, the quartz cuvette is clamped between two silicone seals. So it is sealed off. Uh, we don't have to worry about evaporation because the seals are tight. Um, so when it comes to chemical compatibility, um, quartz, glass, and silicone. If your analytes and buffer conditions are compatible with quartz, glass, and silicone, you're good to go. But again, um, nine microliters of sample are sealed off by silicone in quartz and uh, evaporation is not an issue. And isothermal experiments are a very interesting field of study to do with UNCLE, sure. Definitely. Uh, does iodixinol ever impact this kind of fluorescent assay? Um, iodixinol is a component that is used in um, centrifugation, we build the density gradient. And if you have that carried over into your AAV prep after centrifugation, um, it does interfere a little bit with the fluorescence uh, because it does absorb in the UV and it fluorescence also in the same range as the, as the proteins. So the capsid stability looking at the protein unfolding can be impacted by iodic iodixinol. Especially interesting that iodixinol fluorescence increases as the temperature increases. So you can maybe use that to see if there's iodixinol present because you will see an increase in fluorescence as the temperature increases. Altogether, the genome ejection, because we're using cyber gold and we're looking at more the red part of the spectrum, it's, it's not a problem, but iodixinol can have an impact on the readability of the protein intrinsic fluorescence. Yeah. See the impact, know if it's there, and then even get around that problem. Uh, uh, we, so this question, what consumables do we need to run uh, the uncle? We talked a little bit about the, um, the dye a little bit already. Um, yeah, any other comment to add to that? Around what consumables are needed to run AAV samples on UNCLE? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So um, in order to run UNCLE, um, you need the unit. You need the cuvettes. These are the consumables. Um, consumables come to the, the cuvettes come together with a silicone seal, so you don't have to worry about having to reuse the seal because for every unit, you get more than two seals because we give you some extras. Um, so you're good there. And then if you want to run um, the protein intrinsic fluorescence stuff, you just need to sample and your buffers, of course. Uh, if you need um, cyber gold, um, that would be another consumable to use. But other than that, Uncle has everything else built in. Um, there's one Uncle, and it always has the three features of fluorescence, um, static and dynamic light scattering in the temperature controlled environment. So you're good to go with the Uncle and the units. Is Uncle able to determine tighter and full empty ratio or empty full ratio of AAV? Um, um, be that the tighter or be that the full empty ratio, I recommend you take a look at Uncle's sibling, the stunner. That's our instrument for quantitation. It uses two microliters of sample. It uses a 96 well plate. So it has a 
twice the throughput of, of uncle and that would be um, an instrument that is built with quantitation in mind so if you want to do um, tethering or if you want to do full empty ratio considerations um, I would recommend you use stunner okay and can uncle can this instrument be used in GXP uh, uh, environments so in good manufacturing good laboratory practice yes it can um, Uncle Software has uh, features that are compliant with 21 CFR Part 11, and we can also do the um, installation qualification and uh, operation qualification, so that with these tools coming together, Uncle is um, well prepared to be used in a GXP environment. Okay. All right. And with that, we are at the uh, bottom of the hour and run through our, our questions that have come in. Um, Thanks for answering all those great questions, Andre, and thank you for a great presentation. Uh, I also, yeah, I also want to thank those of you who joined us uh, live today. If you want to have a deeper conversation with our team, think of a question maybe tomorrow, uh, please do get in touch with us at info at unchainlabs.com or simply learn more from our website at unchainlabs.com. Uh, we'd love to connect with you and have a chat about science. So thank you again for attending our virtual seminar, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.